Episode 7. A photograph says a thousand words. The day following Pierre's emotional breakdown proved altogether mundane, though Marca again began having her meals alongside him, and though they went for their regular walk around town, they talked little. It would be nice to say that simply breaking down in Marca's arms after presuming the light from a kitchen fridge was a portal to another world would be the sort of fairy tale occurrence to bring the two unbreakably closer together, and offer them to get over all their emotional hang-ups. However, real life is seldom that simple. And so they had spent the day blushing sheepishly at one another, and only speaking around in circles on topics like the weather. The second morning after they made up, almost 36 hours on exactly, was proving to be quite similar. They had had a relaxing breakfast, and now the duo found themselves in Pierre's living room. The space was the sort one might look at and think of a 1990s TV set. Faded wallpaper and soft reds and yellows, pieces of ornate furniture and an old box television. The parlour was situated across from the dining room on the house's ground floor, and as such had the same corridor-style layout, with a, dis- a disused fireplace to one end, and metre-tall windows against the exterior wall, letting in a glorious amount of early morning sunlight. Pierre sat in an old and worn armchair, reading the daily paper as delivered to his doorstep, though in truth he did more awkward glances in Mocker's direction than actual reading. For her part, Mocker floated around, admiring various objects in the room. She had taken something of a liking to the antiquated television, but today both she and it were silent, as the slightly off atmosphere between the two continued to hang over them like an axe. 60 seconds, 100 seconds, 150 seconds, tick tock, tick bloody. Pierre, what's this structure? Marker's voice cut through Pierre's thoughts like a most welcome scalpel. As nonchalantly as possible, Pierre laid down the newspaper to look at what she had indicated towards. It was the model of some techno titlon pyramid. The souvenir lay proudly at the centre of the mantelpiece, crafted from actual rock in the area. It was a fine-scale modern of the ancient New World Monument, with its square layers creeping into a pyramidal point. Hmm, ah, yes, an Aztec pyramid. Fascinating people, you know, built these amazing cities and worship some interesting ideals. Pierre said. And these two? Marker beckoned, pointing towards two other structures. Uh, the one on the left is the Eiffel Tower in France, and to the right is an Egyptian pyramid, Pierre recited like some tour guide. Marker nodded appreciatively. They're all, um, triangles. Is, uh, is that important? In an instant, Pierre felt the air change and the tension fade. He smiled and then laughed loudly, springing from his chair. Marker blushed. What? Did I ask a silly question? No, no, it's a good question, Pierre said between laughter. He strode over to a picture hanging on the wall and pointed for Marker to look at it. This here is a photo I took of Stonehenge. When I first arrived, it was one of the places I had an interest in. Of course, with time, I've discounted it. Just some burial grounds or religious site. But when I first arrived on Earth, I had no way of knowing that. I'm not sure I follow, Marker replied earnestly. Pierre nodded. All of these are places and structures I investigated when I first arrived here on Earth. He took Marker lightly by the shoulder into the hallway and began pointing to places on a map affixed to the staircase's exterior surface. Pierre had seen her looking at the map before, the type where the world is laid out flat with all the country's names written on it. Considering her almost photographic memory, she had probably already learnt the names of every place on Earth, but he pointed to specific places nonetheless. This here is uh, the Bermuda Triangle, Back in the 90s, it was still a big deal. Planes and boats seemingly went in and never returned. It it couldn't be penetrated by radio signals. Oh, and this here is predicted to be where Area 50... Pierre, my friend. Uh, Yes, Marker. You haven't answered my question. If anything, I have even more now. Ah, right, good point. Well, put lightly, when I first arrived... uh, Pierre hesitated for a few moments, seemingly considering changing the topic, but then he pressed on. Well... Put honestly, things were they were tough. I didn't speak a word of the language, and I didn't have a penny to my name. I spent longer, er, uh, well, a longer time than I would have liked sleeping in <laughs> shop doorways and down cold street alleyways. But thankfully, it turned out I wasn't the only one who couldn't speak the language. Even to this day, many foreigners come here for work. They pick fruits, work in packaging, food factories, drive lorries, a bit of everything, really. And like me, some of them didn't exactly speak much English. So I got myself little jobs, blended in as some sort of foreigner, moving around the country and slowly learning odd words of English here and there, along with a few quid to call my own. 
And after that, you became a storyteller, Maka added enthusiastically. Ha! If only it were that easy. No, I'm afraid, Maka, it takes a bit more than that to become an author in this world, Pierre said, and then began to trace a line throughout the continent of Europe on the map. I went backpacking, crossing from country to country. My aim was simple. If I got transported here, then perhaps something could send me back. He gestured his hand to more souvenirs and framed photos of famous landmarks around the corridor. Oh, now I see. And uh, what did you find? Pierre frowned. <laughs> Not a lot, I'm afraid. Oh, sure, this world is full of mysteries and unexplained locations, but none of them all seemed that helpful. The Aztecs were the closest I ever got. Their structures of their pyramids are very similar in style to one I remember from back home, but nothing ever came of it. Magi don't seem to have ever existed here, well, except for you and me, I guess. Oh, do you still travel? Maka asked, a little deflated. Mm, oh, God, no, I gave that up years ago. <laughs> Decades now, I suppose. Maka reeled at the awkward turn the conversation had taken, searching around herself for a change in topic. Uh, um, did you, uh, did you say you made these f photographs by yourself? My good man, I presumed a specialist of some kind was needed to create these. Pierre broke from his dark musings. What? Oh, yes, they're just Polaroids. You know, that camera is probably still here somewhere. Well, then, you must show it to me so we might take one of these pictures, Maka said, clapping excitedly with almost childish glee. Up to. So it was that Maka half pushed Pierre up to the second floor where, just across from her own bedroom, in fact, Pierre introduced Maka to his storeroom. A part of her did wonder what the logic of having such a room on the middle floor of the house was, but these thoughts were quickly replaced by ones retaining to the room itself. Despite being on the aforementioned second floor, the storeroom very much so looked like an attic. It was packed to the brim with cardboard boxes and junk. So full, in fact, that only a sliver of light made it through the window, the rest covered by more piled-high boxes. Cobwebs lined everything, and a layer of dust coated the floor. Ah, uh, excuse the mess, I tend to just throw things in here, Pierre said briskly upon seeing Maka's expression towards the room. But surely you need to come and retrieve things from here, yes? What? Oh, no, not often. Never looking back, Marka mumbled inaudibly under her breath with a deep sadness. Pierre began to rifle through the room, shuffling past the stacked items, his grey hair giving him a sort of natural camouflage among the dust-laden place. Marka stuck near the entrance of the room, peering cautiously into some of the closer boxes. I found it! What, what, what are you doing? Pierre said worriedly. An angered look had come over Marka's youthful face. Are you not ashamed, Pierre? What is the meaning of this? She exclaimed while holding up a small box of books. Around her feet were dozens of similar boxes. Pierre rose an eyebrow in confusion. These boxes are full of your own books, man. They say your name on them. You have been increasing your own popularity by pr purchasing your product. Despicable, she proclaimed overly dramatically. Pierre found himself laughing again, only to look up at a pouting marker. <laughs> Don't be silly, woman. That would never work unless you were a billionaire or something. Those are all for copies. The publisher sends me five or six copies every time they release one of my books, to be given to friends and family, that sort of thing. Marker flushed a bright scarlet of realisation. Ah, well, how was I to know? It is your fault for putting them all together here suspiciously. Why have you not handed them out yet? The question hung in the air silently until the answer dawned itself on Marka. She did not press for an answer. Instead, she took out one of the novels from the box. You said Undercurrent was your most recent work, the one about where we come from. But these others, what are they? She questioned as casually as she could, to try and once more steer the light-hearted conversation back on track. It was Pierre's turn to have his cheeks redden. Oh, hold on, don't read that one, he pleaded, trying to push his way back to the front of the room, still surrounded by the boxes. Too late, Maka had begun to read aloud. Follow the adventures of the great hero and her four companions in this thrilling instalment as they head to slay the mighty dra- Pierre? Yes? You said the rest of your books were fictional, made up. And yet this sounds awfully like one of our adventures back in the old days. Pierre turned his eyes away from her insinuating glance. <laughs> they, they do say, write what you know, and <laughs> no one in this world is any the wiser, he mumbled. Marga grinned stupidly before grabbing up more of the books from the boxes around her and making a run for it. Hey, hey what are you doing? 
Bring those back. No one said you could read those. They're just fiction, I tell you. Any similarities to real events are just coincidences. Fiction. Marker, come back here, girl. Pierre yelled after the girl with the silver hair, his face growing ever more crimson as she laughed her way teasingly down the hallway. And so it was on the 9th of February, just a mere five spans from a certain special day, and more than 20 years after his initial purchasing of the large London townhouse, that Pierre framed his first photo containing people rather than objects. A photo taken on an old, chunky black Polaroid camera, an image of a man and a woman, one with silvered hair and the other grey, a portrait of the two standing next to one another, with the girl leaning in against the man, a finger poking his cheek playfully as the man tries to keep his facial expression composed. A photo of two happy and sincere smiles. It was also the first time Pierre ever gifted someone an author's copy of one of his books, if a little begrudgingly.